finished uh, um, um, last lecture with this uh, unfortunate break in the internet communication. Let's hope that that's, uh, nothing like this will happen again. And uh, uh, we, we shall, uh, we, uh, as I said, we finish on the, on the invention of a new kind of a building material in quotation mark, which is called the reinforced concrete which had allowed the construction of the much bigger buildings built much faster. And uh, we will continue today. So let me now uh, share the screen uh, to show you the slides. And um, uh, that's our lecture. And um, and uh, the end of the 19th century is uh, the time when uh, completely new materials have been invented and will become available for the all sorts of possible application. And those materials are today called plastics. And uh, probably the first material which can be called plastic in contemporary sense was uh, a material made out of the cellulose. A cellulose is a building material out of which the cell walls in plants are built. And that is being shown here on this uh, on this uh, slide, and uh, in uh, uh, 1860s, uh, several independent uh, inventors, chemists, engineers, and pure adventure people had come to the the almost the same technical conclusion, but the first patent for the material called celluloid, and that was uh, uh, shown here, the name had been uh, had been um, patented by the American uh, inventor Hyatt, and uh, uh, originally it was the material invented out, out of the cellulose, as I said, to replace expensive billiard balls. The billiard balls have been made at that time essentially only out of ivory. And the ivory was difficult to get. It had to be brought from Africa or India after slaying the elephants. And uh, uh, it, it, even, a, even if the ivory, if the tusk of the elephants were available, the production of those balls, which are shown on the right, was pretty expensive. So the lots of people were trying to figure out how to replace the ivory. And the point is that the uh, billiard balls had to be extremely not only spherical, I mean, because otherwise the collision in the game will be uh, completely unpredictable. And the other thing is that the collision between the different billiard balls had to be as close as possible to the elastic collision. So the material had to fulfill a very strange requirements for the model, elastic modular. And the cellulite, which was made out of the essentially uh, a cotton, uh, ha, was not truly replacement of the ivory, but the billiard balls start to be produced uh, in a complicated fashion that the interior was made from the other 
biological material uh, and the outer shell of the ball was made out of the celluloid. The celluloid was immediately recognized as a fantastic material for many other possible application. For example, uh, toys, uh, dolls, for example, as I have shown here, have been made out of the celluloid. And um, it very quickly, it was found that the celluloid can also be made as a thin layers. And very quickly, those thin layers of a celluloid was used as a replacement for the glass in growing at the time um, business, let's say it, of the photography. The early photography was, uh, the development was hindered by the fact that the plates which were covered by photosensitive materials were heavy. They were made of the glass. If you can imagine uh, that we already, uh, that we have the, the pictures, the photographies of the uh, essential, all the battles of the civil war fought in the uh, United States roughly in the uh, second half of the 19th century. For example, we have the photography of the Battle of Gettysburg and the others. Then you can also think how, I mean, how the incredible was the operation of getting those photographs. They, not only the cameras were very huge, they require a mechanical structure on which it can be posed for just making the picture, but also that the uh, uh, that the those photographers had to carry several of those glass very heavy plates, which then had to be specially covered so they will don't get destroyed by the light after the picture was taken and brought back to some place where the complicated chemical laboratory was built to produce the pictures. But immediately it was recognized that the photography is going to be a major, not only art, but also the major business in the forthcoming, forthcoming, uh, forthcoming years. And uh, one of the, one of the applications of a celluloid was, as I said, the application of a thin layers, which led to the, what is shown on the slide, to the photography and the film, and the films for the movie. And um, that was a complicated uh, development. Many entrepreneurs were attempting to produce the, the films, particularly the movie films. And um, we will come to that in a moment, but I would like to show you also something which was that the celluloid make a tremendous progress in a branch of applied science, which is called numerical mathematics. And that is, the, uh, that is the picture of a contemporary slide rule. I don't know whether you have ever had uh, a slide rule in your hands or if, whether you even know that that was a device on which most of the calculations have been done. Uh, the, uh, uh, sorry. It was uh, invented by William Otmrit in the 17th century. And uh, it is a, a device which has a several movable pieces in that particular one, which is a slide rule produced by the probably the most famous company which made the slide rules, 
uh, uh, I don't have the plus the celluloid uh, made uh, slide rule. I have a metal slide rule at the institute in in Warsaw, but I wasn't there due to the COVID restriction for the last few weeks, so I can show you this. But that is this. There are the, the there are three. On that pick, they have a three rows, so to say, and the middle one is movable, and uh, the marks on it are properly made following a logarithm scale. And when you move this middle one and attach the numbers in the upper and on the edges of the upper or the lowest uh, band, with those in the middle movable band, you can do tremendous amount of calculations with the accuracy of a two digits. Uh, and, uh, or, and if you have a very long, uh, high quality slide rules, even perhaps at three digits after the decimal point. And um, so you could do multiplication, uh, calculate trigonometric functions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the first slide rules were, I mean, making them from the wood, which was the initial material used for making a slide rules, was, uh, was a tremendous undertaking. And they wear off very quickly. And the accuracy of calculation becomes unacceptable when the celluloid was used to make the slide rule that it was a very durable and the accuracy of the calculations done by the slide rules were extremely fast. Uh, most of the uh, engineering calculations for making a device we call today atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project was done by the people operating the slide rules. The uh, electronic calculators, electric calculators, or the, the, the move with a knob which you turn with your hand, calculators were not as popular at those times and the accuracy was much lower than the accuracy which was uh, 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 achievable on the on the uh, on the slide rules so the uh, the celluloid was everywhere not only in making tools or the as i said the uh, materials for photography and films but also was original materials made for the for the slide rules Eventually, it was replaced by the um, light metal, like aluminum. Aluminum become uh, very popular, so the metal slide rules become um, uh, uh, widely used. Um, that will be a short introduction to the history of the movie films which I call from a gun cotton to the movie films. The production of a celluloid started with the discovery of a explosive material called gun cotton. It was uh, an accidental that uh, the, 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 the certain gentleman, Christian Friedrich Schönbein in the, in the 19th century by Essentially, accident. He used a mixture of the of the nitrogen acid and the sulfuric acid, and uh, pour the mixture of those acids on a, on an apron. Basically, he had spilled those acids on the experimental table in his lab and use the apron, cotton apron, to wipe it off. And then he, it was wet, the apron. So he hung it over the uh, open fire to dry it. 
and uh, he dried very efficiently because after a while the apron had exploded. And that way he discovered that the cotton, which uh, is uh, treated with the mixture of the various acids, retain its color. It's still a white, but it explodes at the temperature, which depends slightly on the what kind of acid you have mixed. And uh, the, so for the original experiment, as it turns out, that it was uh, one part of cotton over the 15 parts of acids. And the gun cotton was the cheap and very efficient replacement for the for uh, powder in, in gunpowder and it was used for the for making the for i mean for in artillery in in gun productions and etc if you uh, remember we were talking about the Gilles Verne and i mentioned to you the book by mention the the tre the treasure island uh, by uh, by Verne, on the way, in which this uh, bunch of uh, individuals is uh, uh, on this inhabited island, and there one of them is Cyrus Smith, who is an engineer, and he recreates the civilization on an island, inventing various things out of the raw materials available on the island. And he also makes up the gunpowder. And with the gunpowder, they can blow the rocks and uh, they can also defend themselves against the invaders and et cetera, et cetera. So the gun cotton was uh, known. This was not a very good explosive material because it was very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to handle and it might explode uh, at unpredictable moments. And uh, one of the uh, materials which was similar to the gun cotton was uh, a liquid explosive nitroglycerin with, and uh, I don't know, you probably haven't seen that both the movie, there was a movie made in the late 40s or at the beginning of the 50s, I don't remember exactly, which is a, a, a film with, uh, in which the, the very famous French actor Yves Montand is starring. And um, that was a story about the, uh, uh, the, the bunch of uh, desperados taking uh, cars with the tanks of the nitroglycerin over the incredibly dangerous road to a, a place where the, the uh, not the gasoline but um, crude oil uh, uh, tower is burning and then explosions of a nitroglycerin was used and it uh, at the time to blow up the fires on the uh, uh, serious fires. So the, this explosive, but very quickly it was turned that they treated with the acid, a cotton and similar um, uh, materials they can be made into the thin layers, which were very elastic. And that was the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the making uh, films for the movie cameras, which had to rotate. But before it, let me show you this uh, picture, which I found on the internet. This is a Nestle milk can which was convert the, 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 these milk guns were available during the first world war and was this, and this, uh, at that time, the soldiers in the trenches of the first war used the cans 
after they drink the milk to make a makeshift uh, uh, grenades, hand grenades, and the, these hand grenades were the grenades with the gun, but with the gun cotton, and uh, that is a, that is a picture of one of those uh, hand grenades. But the careful production uh, of uh, the treating of the cotton with the with the acid. Uh, allowed for making extremely thin, durable, and elastic film, which can be covered with the photosensitive material. And uh, the, the picture of a George Eastman is here, because George Eastman was the first individual who made the production of those films for uh, movies and uh, also for the steel cameras, uh, so precise and so standardized that he could open up a company. The company was called Kodak. And for years and years and years, the Kodak was a synonym of a photo camera and for a production of high quality films. George Eastman was one of those individuals and uh, in the history of United States, this period is called Three Georges. There was a George Eastman who created the Kodak. The, there was a biggest George, the George Westinghouse, who had built up the alternating current networks and who had won the so-called current war, which was fought between the Westinghouse and uh, Edison for whether we will use the direct current or alternating current in uh, sending or covering the world with the networks supplying us with electricity. And uh, the third George was George Pullman, who had invented the railroad cards. And it is remarkable that uh, if you get inside of the a railroad card nowadays, it might from the outside looks differently and might be a levitating uh, magnetic train in uh, next to Shanghai. But the idea how the compartments of the uh, uh, railroad uh, uh, cards should look like and how the the architecture uh, is uh, uh, used is exactly the same as it was or slightly changed from the invention of a George Pullman. So George Eastman was uh, the creator of the movie films and we will be discussing a lot of the uh, movies, how they react to the development of science, but this was this is an example of uh, uh, that the new materials allowed the creation of a new part of our contemporary art, which is a photography or the uh, or the or the or the movie film, and the photography, particularly still photography, is nowadays considered by many people to be uh, similarly in uh, its uh, influence on our life to the paintings. Uh, all right. So uh, the movie film, and that is uh, 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 a slight digression, uh, the, the movies, the, 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 the way that the movies have shown up and the cameras have been invented by various people, by Edison and, uh, and brothers Lumiere and others, uh, is that there was a, the, the one of the important use of the initial use of the movie cameras was to solve the biological problem, which was a subject of uh, incredible debates 
over uh, a, a, a long time. And that was a question whether the galloping horse is ever floating in the air. Does the running, very fast running horse, galloping horse, is always having at least one of his legs, its legs, on the on the ground. And in the uh, on that day, which is uh, um, uh, 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 18 of July of 1878, one of the first movie directors, so to say, Edward Mybridge, had made a movie of a galloping horse, which had shown that is this particular picture that the galloping horse might be in a sit in the face of its motion such that all the animal legs are off the ground and in some sense the horse at that stage is floating in the in the air so this was a, a use of a movie to this and uh, there are hundreds or thousands of uh, uses of the movie cameras and movie recordings in uh, uh, in contemporary uh, in contemporary science and sure enough nowadays we are not really taking making movies on the movie films anymore because most of the movies are now made digital uh, and uh, and the one of the reasons why the it was uh, well the first for, I, I mean all right and the point is that um, that uh, uh, the Eastman uh, George Eastman films were very durable and very nice good but they had one shortcoming they are they were flammable and uh, that was a a, a serious problem that the uh, uh, that the that at that time people were one of the serious issues was that at the time of the 19th century a lots of people were smoking so there were in, there was lots of the open fire and uh, the film operators and uh, all the crew which works on the films and so forth, they were smoking. So there were lots of fire in the vicinity of a film. And since the film was extremely flammable, there was a danger each time. And there was a particular danger in showing the film because the projectors with which the recorded movie was shown in the movie theaters they had been a complicated machinery and the film in those machineries were getting hot by a friction over all those complicated uh, driving wheels which were carrying the film over the projector and uh, there was always a danger that the fire will start in the projection machine and of course the fire in the uh, in the movie theater which was dark and uh, and crowded uh, was extremely dangerous and uh, the history knows many cases were uh, that led to a, a serious disasters uh, a celluloid was uh, has a, is a plastic which is extremely good from a today's point of view namely it is biodegradable and um, uh, we don't have the problem it decays uh, in put in a proper hips uh, somewhere it decays uh, because it's basically a, a, a cellulose so it decays and uh, does not cause the same problem with disposal as contemporary plastics the there was also the other application of a celluloid that many layers of a celluloid 
was used as a kind of a shield uh, for the pilots of the military planes in the during the first uh, world war those planes were flying very low and therefore it was easy to shut it with a gun and uh, the pilot seats were covered with many many layers of a celluloid which was the first kind of a uh, bulletproof west in a sense uh, in the in so that was another use of a celluloid but the celluloid was uh, elastic material and the first uh, uh, first uh, first uh, first uh, 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 first uh, brittle so to say plastic was invented at the turn of a century by the belgium chemist bickland and uh, very quickly that material was called was called bakelite and bakelite was a plastic material which had been used everywhere. This is the original device in which Mr. Beckland was making that material. And here is the example for what the bakelite was used. Probably uh, the most famous use of a bakelite, which had continued until the 20th century, was that the uh, uh, telephones, uh, uh, line telephones, have been made out of the bakelite. This is the, 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 the this is, and um, the the telephones were brittle, and when they, you you must have seen in many films, people are smashing uh, telephones because they have been made out of the bakelite, which breaks easily. But that was a very durable and uh, unresist, I mean, material. And uh, it, it was easy to make it in all possible forms. And uh, <laughs> in 72, when I first time in my life, I ended up in the United States working at Carnegie Mellon University. The, uh, at that time, there was the, the telephone system was a monopoly. In the United States, it was completely used by the Bell uh, by Bell Company, and uh, you were not even allowed to buy any other telephones. All the telephones apparatus, the, the sets uh, in the United States, they had to be purchased from the Bell. They were very cheap, and even the plugs to the wall uh, to which the telephone was uh, hooked up. They have been owned by the by the company Bell, uh, and that is of course uh, that was broken later in the seventies, and we had this revolution of a telephone systems. But there are other items which are made of the bakelite, the buttons, and some of the buttons uh, are still made out of the. Out of the out, out of the backlight, there was a competition with the buttons. There were some buttons which were made of a casein. Casein is left over from uh, uh, production of a cheeses and things like this, but the from the milk. But uh, so the casein was also used for making a, a for a kind of a plastic. The backlight was used for making a jewelry. All sorts of possible equipment buttons. This is this plaque for a telephone, which was also the backlight. And that is that the first cheap radio sets were uh, also made out of the backlight. And um, I, I don't have a better picture of that, but this is this backlight uh, radio set called toaster uh, because it looks like a, like, a, like a bread toaster from the kitchen. So the bakelite was the, uh, was the next uh, 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 plastic which had appeared. And uh, um, uh, maybe I can 
show you if the internet connection work uh, uh, a short movie uh, showing a production of a bacalite. Oh. oh. I'm sorry. For some reason, it doesn't work. Uh, well, sorry, it doesn't work. So we uh, had this um, overview of the revolution in inventing and manufacturing new materials. Uh, in the turn of a century. And uh, the one of the branches of the art and clearly our culture, which was completely revolutionized by these new materials was the architecture. And uh, I use as an advertising of architecture, a Lego set uh, for, I mean, it is a really very beautiful set which allows you to many to repeat the construction of many important buildings of a contemporary architecture. But uh, but I would like to uh, concentrate on a particular uh, development in the architectural life, which is related to the name of a of a individual called called uh, Walter Gropius. Walter Gropius uh, was a German architect uh, and, uh, and I am showing you here two buildings uh, which have been built by Gropius at the beginning of his uh, architectural career in, on the north of northwest of Poland in the Lake District there along the Drava River. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a granary in Jankovo. Uh, this is a little town. And this is a villa of one of his relatives in the same town. They are nicely re rebuilt now. So uh, one can see uh, some of the original uh, buildings made by the Gropius. Uh, as I said at the beginning of his career, and there's um, nothing revolutionary if, if you look at those pictures, but we will see quickly that Gropius was uh, uh, tremendous uh, and they had the influence. And uh, let me show you what. The Walter Gropius uh, become a, a head of the small artist school located initially in Weimar uh, in Turingen and later on very quickly moved to the town of Dessau next to Dresden. And um, this uh, school had a very long name, but the first uh, part of that were name was the word Bauhaus, building ho homes, houses. And um, the name Bauhaus becomes a, a symbol of a revolution in the world architecture. And I have mentioned here on this slide uh, a few names associated with the, with the Bauhaus. And uh, Bauhaus was the architecture and uh, it was not only the architecture of the building school, it was a school of what we today call a design. And on this ad of the Bauhaus, you see the building up of a kitchen utensils, chairs and so forth. And uh, there are four names here, Walter Gropius, Vasil Kandinsky, we were Mies van, der, Mies van der Rohe and Paul Klee. And in a Bauhaus, the artists, the painters and sculptures, like Lisiecki, we were talking about him, and uh, others 
had mixed up with the architects. So that is why you have here two names of the architects, Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe, and two very famous painters, Vasil Kandinsky and Paul Klee. This is the headquarters of a Bauhaus in uh, Dessau. And these are the photographers of these gentlemen, Grab Gropius, uh, Kandinsky, Mies von der Rohe, and Paul Klee. And uh, that is the, uh, that is the uh, a list of the teachers in the school. I'm sorry, I have not translated it properly, so I will help you. This is the three columns. This is what was the subject. This is a Fallmeister, the artist who was teaching it. And, uh, the, and those who were assistant helping in the, let's say, lab, who were helping to run the laboratories for the lectures. And we have printing and Mr. Feininger. And uh, let me skip. Uh, there are these arrows pointing up on the names which I already mentioned. Walter Gropius was teaching a carpenter. Uh, uh, a painting of fresques, which was important for decorating the building, was Vasil Kandinsky. Uh, making a nice books, introing, making a books and that they look very nice, that was taught by the Paul Klee. And the architecture, which was the main, uh, it was a jewel in the crown of a Bauhaus, was taught by Walter Gropius, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and Hannes Meyer. Out of the, all of them were at the stage of the game uh, directors of the Bauhaus. And that is a close up of a Bauhaus headquarters. And that was a one, first building which used the, those glass plates we were talking about, which invented that you can build up a building such that the weight of the building was not held by the walls, but by the inner structure, which was made as durable as it was required by using, for example, reinforced concrete. And therefore the walls could be only used for screening the internal from the outside influence. And therefore the walls of the buildings can be made out of the plate glass. So that the building of a Bauhaus, the headquarters, has become a sign of the revolution to come. The making a walls, not the elements which holds the weight of the buildings, but it's just the screen. And if you look on those giant buildings, the skyscrapers are popping out everywhere in Warsaw, then you will see that the walls are out of the glass. The weight is held by the inner structure, which is either a pure steel or a reinforced concrete or mixture of them. But those walls were made out of the plate glass. And that is why I have spent so much time telling you about the plate glass production, how that influenced the possibility of architectural progress. There are, uh, when the, when the uh, uh, Bauhaus moved from the, from the, uh, from the uh, Weimar to Dessau, the, one of the uh, training for the architecture was helping to build the houses for the, those most important members of a faculty, which you call the masters. And these are two houses of a, originally for a Walter Gropius and for the uh, for 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 
for him and also for the for as I for as I, uh, I think it was for for um, for they, they were built by Grampius, but these were the houses in which Kandinsky and Klee were were living, and those houses were restored to the uh, to the shape you see it here in two thousand. The the life of uh, Bauhaus was uh, was unfortunate, in a sense. It came to existence after the first war. Uh, remarkably, it survived this economical disaster in Europe at the time, in particular Germany. If you will ever have a chance, I advise you to look at but the movie by Ingar Bergman called The Serpent's Egg, which is a story located in a Germany in the late 20s, which shows how disastrous was the uh, situation economical then in Germany. Uh, but the Bauhaus had survived, but unfortunately, it was running into the collision with the politics. It had moved from Weimar to Dessau and flourished in Dessau for a while. But unfortunately, in the 30s, a Nazi party of Adolf Hitler had become a, a, one of the dominating political forces in Germany. And eventually in the 33, it took power with in democratic elections, but quickly had abolished a democracy in Germany. And therefore the institution like a Dessau had become uh, uh, like a Bauhaus in Dessau was um, having uh, serious problems. Walter Grapius well, has had to resign as a director of the of the Bauhaus, and uh, uh, the next uh, director of it was another famous architect, Mies van der Rohe, and uh, it was they bought are those architects which had essentially changed the contemporary architecture. Not only there were others which we will be discussing in a moment but they were very important. This is a Mies van der Rohe on one of his chairs. This is uh, the, they, they were not only building buildings, but they were also art, artists of design. And these are the tables, the Barcelona style table by van der Rohe. And um, this is uh, when Mies van der Rohe had very quickly be uh, told to resign from his position as a director of a Bauhaus. And he was replaced by, by Meyer. And then the school was shut down uh, completely. Uh, what happens to those people? They left. Uh, Kandinsky and Klee end up in France and later during the Second World War, they end up in the United States. And so the Gropius and Miss van der Rohe. Uh, I forgot to tell you about the Gropius, that the Gropius, uh, you remember I show you the picture of Oskar Kokoschka, one of the painting of the two lovers of Kokoschka and the, one of them, the lady on that picture was a, a former wife of the composer Mahler, Alma Mahler. Uh, Alma Mahler, after divorcing Mahler, married a Walter Gropius and then she divorced Gropius and married a, uh, married a, um, a writer, Franz Werfel and uh, 
they they end up in the United States during the war with the, but after a dramatic escape from from occupied France, uh, you also might find in the internet a movie Jakobowski and the Canal, which is a play written by uh, Franz Werfel, and that is Jakobowski is a Jewish. Uh, businessman who is desperately trying to escape over already occupied by German France. And uh, Connell is a Polish uh, high officer of a Polish army, which had over the Romania went to, from occupied already Poland to France, who is also trying to find out the way to get out of France because he carries some important documents for the Polish government in London. And um, so Ms. van der Rohe and Gropius end up in the United States. And this is the one of the buildings which uh, I had a picture of, uh, which was built by the Ms. van der Rohe, uh, which is called the Farnsworth House in Pennsylvania in the 50, in the 51. They become uh, an element of the, I would say, a landscape of the uh, uh, world. Um, the buildings are everywhere. And uh, uh, in after the war, after the glass plate becomes really easily available, uh, the idea of a Bauhaus to build the houses such that the glass is being used as an external wall, uh, so to say, take off. And one of the first huge buildings uh, which had been uh, built in that technique was uh, a building which is United Nations building in New York City, which was completed in, <clears throat> in 1952. And architects was Wallace Carrison, a French architect, Corbusier. You must have heard this name. And the Brazilian uh, architect, Oscar Niemeyer. The, the Corbusier is everywhere. Uh, the buildings a la Corbusier are all over the world. You even have a houses built by the Corbusier in Moscow. And that was built in the 20s, by in 1920s, uh, by the Corbusier in Moscow. And Oscar Niemeyer is the famous architect because he had planned and built up uh, this artificially built city, Brasilia, which is official uh, capital of a country, Brazil which was built in the middle of nowhere from a scratch. Whether this is a good idea of building those cities out of nowhere is I, I have never been in Brazil, but Le Corbusier built up a, a, a also artificial town on the foot of the Himalaya in India. This is the name of the town is Chandigarh. And I was twice in Chandigarh. And uh, it is, uh, I mean, it's complete a disaster. It's a the city with the giant streets and the buildings, which is essentially uninhabitable. The, there are not that many people living there. There is lots of shacks around it because to live inside of that city is enormously expensive. So most of the population in India lives outside of it. It's very, as far as I am concerned, this idea of building those build new cities somewhere in the middle of nowhere turned out to be a, a disaster. So anyway, this is this first skyscraper, Isla Bauhaus, which was built by the architects which, who have never been uh, members of a Bauhaus. But uh, uh, very quickly, uh, the much higher building was, the, which is called the Seagram building, was built in 1959 
by Mies van der Rohe. And that is, uh, a, that is, I mean, in, in every book about the architecture, contemporary architecture, you will see that, that picture. The, how the whole area in the town around is built. That is the idea. If you will go in Warsaw on Grzybowska Street into this new open up a part of a city which is built and it's called the old brewery. And uh, there was before the second war, there was a uh, Haberbusch and Schiele brewery, brewery there in Warsaw. And if you go there, you will see that the, this idea of having uh, avenues point ending up with the one uh, a point, like the skyscraper of some historical monument. And that is, that is exactly what is uh, uh, in the mind of contemporary architecture, planning these uh, new parts of the various cities. But I would like to show you the, I mean, this, this you see what was the uh, idea of this modern architecture by, by Mies van der Rohe. I mean, I'm a simple block, simple glass block standing there. There no nothing, just the glass block. But this was another Mies van der Rohe. When he was still in Germany in the 30s, he, was advocating the part of architecture, a direction in the architecture, which called the brutality, brutal architecture. And I would like to show you the uh, a, a piece of art of that period, which is uh, Rose Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht Memorial on a Friedrichswald uh, in, in, in Berlin. This, is, this was built in the 30s by uh, Mies van der Rohe. And it was, that's, that is, uh, I mean, uh, this is a, a more or less symbolic grave of uh, two leaders of the workers' revolt in Germany after the first war. After, this is called in history as a Spartacus, uh, uh, uprising in Germany, and the, there were two leaders of it. Rosa Luxemburg was a, a Polish German Jewish uh, intellectual who was one of the, if I can say, mothers of a, a very leftist uh, part of a socialist movement from that time and Karl Liebknecht, who was a leader of a socialist, German socialist, and they were uh, killed by uh, uh, right. Uh, I mean, the, the Spartacus uprising was, uh, was in, in a period when the, there was a tremendous, the, 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 the emperor was already abdicated and there was a political mess in Germany there were socialistic parties and there were ultra-right parties and there was this army which lost the war and which was essentially disbanded and then recreated as a kind of the smaller army because the Treaty of Versailles does not allow the Germany for having such structured armies during the, the time of empire. And uh, uh, there was a very confused political period and Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lipnick were murdered by the rightist uh, members of the rightist uh, militia, we will say nowadays. And uh, when they, the body, when they were buried, I mean, the Lipnick was buried on unmarked grave and Rosa Luxemburg body was found weeks later and uh, and it's not clear whether that was really a body of Rosa Luxemburg, but that's a history, not, not uh, architecture. And in any case, in the thirties, uh, a German socialist uh, party decided to build up on the, on the, on the uh, one of the cemeteries in Berlin, which is from that time called the socialist. Uh, cemetery in 
is called the Friedrichsfelder, and they are uh, they uh, they ask Miss von der Rauhe to build up the the, the to plan and build up this uh, this grave, and that is a part of what's called the uh, what was the brutal architecture that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Tomps was destroyed by the Nazis in the thirties five, I believe and uh, was raised to ground. And uh, it has never been reconstructed after the second war, but uh, a material which was used for Van der Rohe was in various places on the Friedrichsfelder. And that was used during the division of Germany uh, because the Friedrichsfelder is in, is, was in the is in the part which used to be in the Deutsche Demokratische Republik in the in the eastern part of the Berlin. So the whatever was uh, assumed to be the material building material from that uh, tombstone of Rose Luxemburg and Nipkneft that was used for building another monument on the Friedrichsfelde. So in the some sense it is preserved. But I mean, these are the, uh, uh, I mean, somehow the, the, the landmarks of the influence of the Mies van der Rohe into the contemporary architecture, the brutality, brutal architecture, which is uh, still existing. And you can find out the buildings in the various places the world build up as uh, this brutal architecture even nowadays, and there is a Seagram building. And uh, the Gropius couldn't, of course, be uh, another, and that is the, uh, in the 63, uh, uh, Walter Gropius with the, with the Richard um, Roth, they built up a building in the 63, which you see, this is a very similar idea. I mean, this is this Bauhaus printout. And uh, this was a building for the, at that time, the biggest uh, airline in the world, Pan American. And uh, there is even a label Pan Am on top of that building. And this is a skyscraper which sits on top of a railroad station. And uh, when in the, in, uh, when the Pan American has collapsed, and the Pan American, which was in some sense a, a state, a symbol of the United States airline. I mean, out of those two giant airlines which initiated the uh, area of the air com communication, Pan American, and it, uh, the Howard Hughes uh, TWA transworld airlines, both of them do not exist anymore. They were replaced, but the other companies, Delta, United, and you know, Southwest, and hundreds of others, and that building was purchased by a company which was called Amplico. It was an insurance company. And before they managed to change the name on top of the building from Panam to Amplico, the Amplico was over and it was replaced by the company called MetLife, MetLife, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. And that building, if you will now be in New York, the Panam is not, no longer there. There is just called the MetLife building. And the MetLife company is existing in Warsaw. It is a company which takes a pride in restoring buildings. And this is a metal, this is a plant this is a sign on the wall of the of the building in Warsaw, which has been restored and rebuilt uh, by the company, which it was still called Amplico. That's why on that on there is Amplico here, not uh, MetLife. But I mean, that's a, I, that is a sign that Amplico, that the MetLife MetLife is also the insurance company which operates in 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 Poland. So the architecture was changed by that invention of a plate glass and for making and the reinforced concrete, which, and of course a steel 
So that's why they, I pick up um, steel production, plate glass, and concrete uh, as the uh, as the uh, as as the milestone for the uh, for the developments of art during the period of the new materials. Uh, to complete with Bauhaus, the Bauhaus influenced many artists, architects all over the world. This is the Bauhaus in Warsaw. Uh, the people who had been trained in Bauhaus and were very much uh, influenced by the ideology of a Bauhaus people like Agropius, they building that they should be simple and nice to live in and cheap enough to allow the workers to, to have a decent housing. And the main, so to say, propagators of a Bauhaus idea was a, was a, was a, was a were two architects, Helena and Shimon Circus. And in the 1930, around that time, they built up, they start building a workers' quarter of Warsaw, which is on the Kowa Street, on Obozowa Street in Warsaw. And that is uh, a picture of uh, the Bauhaus style houses in Warsaw. It's not the only one. This is uh, another building by uh, uh, another several buildings built by Circus, by Helena and Shimon Circus in Warsaw, roughly at the same time. And that is actually a build. These are buildings which are something like uh, 400 meters, 300 meters from where I live in Warsaw. And uh, this is now the, the kind of a culture house in Warsaw. There are lots of activities there for uh, for the senior people and for the children. And the, 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 that is also characteristic uh, buildings for, uh, for a Bauhaus style. But the most uh, fantastic buildings of that style is the uh, Warsaw uh, Sport Academy, AWF, uh, which, is, uh, which is carrying the name of Józef Piłsudski, the Marshal Piłsudski name, and that is uh, that is on the on the north of Warsaw, in 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 Bielany, and that is the one of the buildings there. The architect who built the AW, the AWF, this sport academy, Piłsudski Sport Academy, was Edward Norwert, and uh, uh, this is actually a beautifully planned. Uh, uh, whole campus. Uh, it's basically the only really truly sensibly planned uh, campus of the kind of you uh, in 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 Warsaw. Uh, it's a pleasant park also, so it's it's nice to take a walk there when it's nice weather to see that. And uh, that is the race course in Warsaw, uh, which is not far from the Institute of Physics of Polish Academy of Science. If you, if you continue on the Puławska Street, uh, um, uh, south from, uh, uh, um, if you go on the Aleja Wilanowska and go to the Puławska Street and turn right, that is south, and if you continue under the this overpass of the of the which goes towards Rusinov, if you continue on the street towards the the suburb of Warsaw Piasecno, then on your right you will see the wall which separates the horse race track uh, in Warsaw from the from the from the from the, from the street. And what is inside is that building. And that is uh, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, race courses uh, in Europe. Uh, so it's also the nice place to visit. I'm not suggesting that you should bet on courses there. I, could, I can confess that I was there once 
and I bet on the horses, not very much, but I lost everything. But I had a friend who was a physicist who supported himself through all his period and the university as a student by playing on horses and he somehow always win. And the building, uh, this beautiful building was uh, uh, the architect who constructed was Zygmunt Platter Ziberak. So the, uh, and that if you will, if I will be giving that lecture in any other city in Europe, then I will be having no problems with replacing those pictures of Bauhaus in Warsaw by Bauhaus in Prague, Bauhaus in somewhere else. The Bauhaus is everywhere. And the modern architecture is tremendously influenced by the Bauhaus. All right. So we are over with the architecture. And I choose the architecture as an example of that part of art and culture, which has been influenced and made possible essentially by the invention of those new materials. And now I would like to uh, start talking about a revolution in science at the end of the 19th century, because that revolution in science at the turn, at the end of the 19th, uh, the second half of the 19th century had also influenced the culture and our life. And it is impossible to start that discussion without a short introduction or reminding you that this was a period where the dominating discovery, scientific discovery was a theory of evolution. And the creator of it was a Charles Darwin. And uh, the, uh, the Darwin, in 1859, his remarkable book, The Origin of Species, have been uh, published. Uh, this is a difficult moment because uh, to even abbrev to give even just attempt to give you a, a short uh, abbreviation of what the origin of species is all about will take a semester. So uh, I have to assume that on during your education, you either have a contact with the theory of evolution and learn what what is, or that you will do it by yourself because that will be a, a incredibly. I mean, that will completely deviate us from from the further discussion. But the uh, the fact that the life on Earth uh, has come out in a process of the evolution, not by a creation, is uh, now accepted the theory. And we have uh, hundreds and thousands of examples that it happened. And uh, remarkably, that uh, uh, there's often said that uh, evolution takes enormously long time to work. But that's not entirely true. Uh, we have the examples of the evolution in biological species, which had happened over the last few hundreds of years. Um, um, but that's, again, uh, something I'm not going to talk about. This is a, a, a front page of the origin of species. And um, as I said, it's one of the most fundamental books in the history of mankind. And, um, but that uh, the theory of evolution of, was not the only breakthrough in the biological sciences which had happened in that period of time. I have shown you the three pictures of three individuals which I have picked up and sure this is a personal choice. Uh, the one is Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen. Uh, Röntgen was the first individual who got Nobel Prize in physics. 
1901. Uh, why the Rundgren is here as a, a sign of a revolution in biological sciences. The reason is that the discovery of the, what is called the Rentgen uh, radiation or X-rays, uh, that was having a dramatical consequence in biology and also, of course, in medicine. That was a discovery which allowed us to see the insight, internal parts of a living body without this destroying that life. Before that, the, what happens inside of the animals and our bodies, that was only available to the analysis of a scientist when the animal or uh, also the human is dead, was dead. Well, the first famous picture, which you must have seen thousands of times, I'm not showing you this, it's this hand of Mrs. Rentgen. That's a side comment. Rentgen wasn't particularly sure what is the influence of this radiation. So when he was taking this picture, he just not used his hand, but his wife. And um, this, uh, this was a picture of a life object. And uh, there is even uh, in the books of radiology, a picture taken out of all those places in Australia by a X-ray picture taken in 1905 of a miner in a complete uniform who is, <laughs> he was alive. And the, the way that we can use the X-rays to see what is happening in the living person, individual or animal, that was, that was a tremendous change. The uh, medical and biological use of the X-rays have become also an example that the science can propagate all over the, our activities as a bushfire. The discovery of that was in the 1893. Uh, and already in the 19, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the X-ray machines were everywhere. Uh, the first, mass use of the x-rays in the medical practice was during uh, one of the wars fought by, by Italy in Libya at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. There was a Italian doctor who built up the x-ray machine and he was the first one to use the x-ray machine to Attempt, attempting to find out the metal fragments left by the in the bodies of the wounded soldiers. <clears throat> At the time, the the, the 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 artillery shells called shrapnels have been invented. They were where they exploded and sending up thousands of little fragments, and uh, those metal fragments penetrate the body. And uh, when it was left there uh, unremoved, it caused the, uh, I mean, in most of the cases led to the, to the death of the wounded person. <clears throat> so the, the, the influence of the X-rays in the biology was a tremendous, and of course, in other branches of techniques as well. The other picture is Ivan Pavlov another Nobel Prize winner in the 1904, 
course, the first person to study the response of a human argument and trying to understand how our reactions to the external uh, stimuli are carried by our nervous system. And the third picture is probably uh, is Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in 1908, he is a founding father of uh, inventing drugs which work point-wise. He, he used the word magic bullet, that we should try to cure people not by uh, applying uh, drugs which influence uh, full activity of our body, but rather trying to find out the drugs which are specific to a particular human organs or specific to a given cause of the disease and use the drugs which he called the magic bullet, that it goes and does only this, kills the given germ. Nowadays, we will say a virus in our body. So the uh, vaccine, vaccine for a COVID, which I hope all of you have already is, is have already been vaccinated. Uh, the it is a magic bullet. This mRNA way of constructing the vaccines is the as of today a final solution, so to say, to the concept of a magic bullet of a Paul Ehrlich. Uh, he is an individual who, I mean, at the at the time, at this, at the, in the night, well, since since the return of a Columbus from um, from his trip, trip, his his journey, the world was Europe was plagued with a, a disease called syphilis, and. Uh, there has been no cure for a syphilis, except of the some indication that uh, uh, mineral water from certain uh, spas in Europe, for example, in a, in a, in the wells in the town of Akfisgran or Aachen or, or other chapel depending on which language you call it, the town of Aachen, which is on the north uh, west of uh, uh, Germany on the, on the Dutch border, uh, uh, the capital of the world during the uh, Karl the Great, and uh, the, that the taking a bath in those waters somehow helped people having uh, external symptoms. Uh, I mean, help, I mean, help a little bit to people who had the syphilis. Uh, we now know that those wells are having a water which is having unusual concentration of a mercury. And uh, it was Paul Ehrlich who had invented a first medicine which cure, truly cure syphilis, which is called salvarsan. And uh, the, uh, uh, that is uh, ointment or anyway, uh, all sorts of similar things, which contains the mercury compounds. And, um, but, uh, the invention of a silver sun was uh, a revolution in the medicine. I mean, if if you go to Aachen and see on a list of the of the famous people who had been frequent 
to the spa there, uh, you, you, you see the list of important persons in the history of mankind who are suffering, uh, suffering from, from syphilis. So Paul Ehrlich was the he was uh, was uh, uh, discovered. I could have equally well put here the name of Robert Koch, the person who had understood what was the reason of the disease, which was even, which was, which was a plague, of a, for years of, that was a tuberculosis, and uh, where the he 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 didn't find. He thought that he had found the the medic, the, the the drugs which would uh, help us to 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 fight the tuberculosis, but that that wasn't the case. We had to wait until the twenty uh, second half of the twentieth century when the modern drugs uh, uh, and they have helped us to get rid of the of the of the uh, of the uh, of the tuberculosis. So these are the names related to the changes in the biological sciences. Uh, well, I would like to show you the a second book by the uh, by uh, Darwin. The book is called The Descent of Man. And the reason why I like to show it to you is that we will be talking in what follows about the other book called Ascent of Man. And this is a book uh, which uh, is extremely important in the modern history because that was the first that it come to existence as a serial, first television serial ever made by a BBC. And that was a serial about the science. Uh, the title Ascent of Man was chosen by a person who was an author of that serial and performing that serial, a Polish born mathematician, Jakob Bronowski, Polish Jewish mathematician, Jakob Bronowski, who had emigrated fortunately from Poland before the second war and up in, in, in England. And he was an accomplished mathematician and incredible philosopher. And uh, the reason why he chose the title for his book and the film and the serial, The Ascent of Man, is that he wanted to tell us the story of a Darwin in a different, in different way. The, we will be talking about the ascent of man in what follows, but I already advertise that for you. It's available in the internet. Uh, all of this part of it, it's a black and white serial. But if uh, I really, I really suggest you to to look at it, because the you will also see if I I I, I I'm making an assumption that some of you must have seen uh, uh, by uh, uh, the the serials of David Attenborough, right? and many others uh, popular science serials which are available. And after you will see the ascent of man, you will realize how difficult it is to break or make a popular science uh, serial which will not follow a screenplay, so to say, the, the way uh, that was invented by, by Bronos. And, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the turn of the, the end of the 19th century was not only the time when the new materials were developed, that the biological science has been completely changed, but also that 
there was a revolution in the social sciences. And I have chosen these two names as, as a sign of it. The one is Karl Marx. Uh, Karl Marx, who uh, was a very deep philosopher, who was one of the first philosophers trying to understand how the economical development, how technological changes, how the changes in the our economy of the world influences our life and whether this is a possible to think about the organizing the life of society during the technological revolution which was happening at the time in a different way than that with, which was going on at that time. And the other individual, and of course, uh, he had written that he had chosen for another view on the philosophy of the cons of a society life, unfortunate name of a communism, which uh, was a philosophical system in the 19th century. And it's hardly possible to blame Karl Marx for excesses and the disaster caused on the greater part of the world by the communist dictatorship, so-called communist dictatorship, uh, which started in the in the Russia after the after the victory of a of a Bolshevik revolution after the First World War. But the other philosopher who influenced the thinking about the society life, which I have chosen is a Herbert Spencer, a British intellectual who in the 19th century was a kind of the Pope of the lay thinkers in the world. It's almost forgotten nowadays, but it is a Herbert Spencer who had also think on a similar issues as Karl Marx, but had provided a completely different solution to them. And uh, at that time, it was a Spencer who invented this word survival of the fitness of the fittest. And that was the, uh, uh, that was a kind of using the evolutionary concepts of Darwin and apply it to the society development of a human society. So Herbert Spencer was a, a giant of that period of time. But that were not only those people, because at that at the end of the 19th century, a, a science of a society has developed in a certain sense independent from a philosophy. And I have picked up three names of it. Emil Durkheim and Max Weber were uh, actually educated as a scientists, they were, but they were experts, in, they were educated in botanics and biology. But then they develop a science, which is today called sociology. It was a Durkheim and Weber, who are the founding father of that branch of science, which we now call the sociology. And they had been tremendously influenced by thinking about the society, the way biologists, evolutionists were thinking uh, after the Darwin. 
And the last of them, who is much less known, particularly in Europe, Lister Ward, was an American geologist. For most of his life, he was employ employed by the US Geological Survey. And uh, Lester Ward uh, was uh, a person, for example, who was one of the first using the statistic ideas and the methods, statistical methods, to trying to answer the Weber also, uh, trying to answer uh, questions he posed, trying to use a method of a statistic to analyze the behavior of a society. But he was also the founding father of a certain way of thinking how the social structure of architects, architecture should develop. And um, uh, there are still uh, uh, groups of architects who claim that they follow exactly the ideas of how the cities have to be built in order to serve the inhabitants the best way and so forth. And these were the ideas of Lester Ward. So these are the founding fathers of modern sociology. And that, of course, is a science which influence uh, culture and our life uh, tremendously. But uh, one of the individuals which I like you to learn, you will hardly ever heard about him, is uh, 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 Joseph Schumpeter. Uh, uh, Schumpeter, uh, uh, he wrote uh, in 30, 1932 a, a book under the title Capitalism Socialism. I'm sorry, there's a mistake in, in the view graph and democracy. And uh, he followed in that book the idea which um, was. Um, uh, uh, also, which make which was sort of picked up from the fourth volume of uh, Karl Marx Capital, this monumental work of Karl Marx, uh, which in German is called Schöpferische Zerstörung, and uh, he, the fellow Werner Sombart, who in the just before the first war wrote the book, Creek and Capitalism, War and Capitalism, in which he had um, uh, used the word Schöpferische uh, Vernichtung. I mean, it's, uh, it's a problem of this incredible plasticity of a German that they can generate various words which essentially mean the same, but in fact, they have a different meaning, like a Zerstörung and Vernichtung. But anyway, the Schumpeter had called it the creative destruction. And that is something which is easy to understand. And uh, Schumpeter was arguing that the progress is happening by a creative destruction of old ideas and method and replaced rapidly and completely by a new ideas which have nothing to do with the old ones. And the reason why I mention it is that it has an important influence on the part of science which develops in the 50s of a 20th century, where a people start to think about how a science about the science, how the science develops, and what are the mechanisms which drives the changes in the science. And we will be talking about that uh, when we will talk about the Thomas Kuhn book, A Scientific Revolution, but a creative destruction 
is a mechanism which fits certain changes in science much better than generally accepted so-called paradigm shift, which was, ad, which was made uh, popular by the Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Scientific Revolution. As I said, we will be talking about it, but let me give you the examples. I mean, to understand the difference between creative destruction. Uh, you all are familiar with the Newtonian physics. In the Newtonian physics, we have a particles and waves. I use the cartoon like pictures, perhaps not very good one, but they, they are the only one available in the toolbox of a Macintosh for that purpose. So we all knew the Newtonian physics. And Newtonian physics was a science of the, of the universe until the turn of the 19th and 20th century, where in exactly 1900, uh, Max Planck had shown that it is impossible to explain the well experimentally established phenomena of a black body radiation by using the concept of Newtonian mechanics and had to assume that the electromagnetic radiation is having a discrete nature and invented the word quantum. And the very quickly, the quantum mechanics, a quantum theory have developed. And it was this old quantum mechanics of Planck, Bohr and Sommerfeld and then it was a matrix mechanics developed by the Heisenberg, Dirac, Jordan, and others. And they were completely different from a Newtonian mechanics. There was no concept of equation of motion of a particle in the uh, matrix mechanics. Equations were different. The concepts were different. They were only waves. And that looked like a creative, if that was the case, that will be a creative destruction. All the concept of a Newtonian physics had to be replaced by the other set of concepts uh, of the theory, which was having a quantum in it or the matrix mechanics. But in fact, it wasn't the case because Niels Bohr has uh, invented a Bohr complementary theory. And if you use the Bohr complementary theory, then they, it's hard to tell. I mean, that will be the weakest statement, whether the change of Newtonian physics and quantum physics is a creative distraction or, or it's the change of a paradigm, which we will be talking later on. So the, in a science, both of those phenomena are possible. And very often it is a creative distraction, which is actually a building, it's a point on which the science makes change. And later on, we discover that perhaps it was the other way. Uh, the most dramatic influence, example of a creative destruction, this complete change of the fundamental ideas was what happened in the biology when Francis Kirk, James Watson, and Morris Wilkins in 1962, they introduced, they, they created the modern way of thinking about the biology than talking about the DNA molecular structure. As, as you know, there should be a fourth name of a Rosalind Franklin, but that is a sad story that she has not been uh, on that 
tremendously important paper. The Kirk Watson Wilkins DNA theory, it was a creative destruction of essentially all the concepts of the biology. Well, it hasn't destructed the, the knowledge of the way the horse is running, which I show you. It's still the case that at the certain stage of a galop, the horse has the all feeds up in the air. But the basic biology is essentially different. The old concepts of biology have been completely destroyed. And uh, the creative destruction is uh, in biology that happened. There was an example in the development of a biology of a creative destruction, which was a disaster, but that was the something I'm not going to tell you because it was completely idiotic. It was a so-called uh, Wysenko Lepieszynska theory in uh, communist biology, which led to the complete destruction of a modern biology in uh, Soviet Union. And, uh, but that's not the subject of my lecture. All right. So we had the, uh, the period where the new science was created. And one of the consequences of all those events was all over the sudden, the development of anti-science. And that we will be talking about it in the next week. For that is a, a story with which we had to move with the slower pace in order to understand what was the reason for this anti-scientific movement, which unfortunately you can see today, maybe not on the streets of Warsaw, fortunately, but in the street of Rotterdam, where the anti-scientific movement burned the part of the city in this anti-vaccination craze. All right, so uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Uh, why is that? Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks for being with me. And uh, this is, has been recorded that it will be today on the on this uh, in this uh, special address uh, under the special address I have sent to you. And we we shall see each other uh, in a week time and uh, have a nice day. Bye bye.